Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. It's April 25th, 2016, and we've just ended the high holy days of Texas history with San Jacinto Day occurring last week. I want to say another thank you to the over 8,000 people listening to Wise About Texas. I am grateful and amazed at the response to this show. I hope you'll take a minute and leave a review on iTunes, like and share our Facebook page, and tell your Texas-loving friends to get wise about Texas. One thing I've heard from many of you is how you can support the show financially. Well, I'm very grateful for that, and the show now has a Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. You can support the show there, and I've put some interesting rewards on the page that can get you to be a part of the show. Well, this year was the 180th anniversary of Texas independence and the first year of Wise About Texas, so I spent the past few episodes talking about the revolution and the fight for independence. It's now time to branch out and start exploring the many incredible stories of Texas history through the decades. I had a listener suggest a great event from Texas history that occurred back in 1896 and was a marketing event on a true Texas scale. It was a train wreck in more ways than one. So let's take the time-traveling train back to 1896 and get wise about Texas. Texans love to travel. There are plenty of places in Texas where a trip to the grocery store is dozens of miles. Since its founding, Texans have loved to hit the road. It's easy now, of course. We've got a huge network of roads that can get you from here to there with relatively little pain. We won't do any podcasting on traffic in Austin or Houston because this is a happy show. But suffice to say, we can get anywhere we want relatively quickly. But that wasn't always the case. During the Texas Revolution, which we've covered the past few episodes, we've been discussing moving around the state from Gonzales to Bejar to Goliad to San Jacinto. But those folks were walking or riding horses. It took days to get anywhere. In Texas, most of the settlement was in the east and toward the south. We've got several rivers to cross to get where you were going in that area of the state. Transportation on the rivers was certainly possible, but the river levels varied so much that commerce on the rivers was not all that reliable. Texas needed the latest and greatest technology available. Texas needed trains. During the Republic, there were several failed attempts to start a railroad. Finally, in 1853, the first railroad in Texas began operating from Harrisburg to Stafford's Point. That's present-day Houston to present-day Stafford. The railroad quickly became the preferred mode of transportation and enabled Texans to go long distances, obviously much quicker than riding a horse. By the closing years of the 19th century, the railroads were extremely powerful in Texas. Here, There was a lot of political consternation and controversy of these powerful businesses. It led to a flurry of lawsuits from the state and eventually the establishment of the Railroad Commission to regulate these powerful entities, and that's the commission that really today is focused more on oil and gas regulation. But the railroads were essential for transportation in Texas. Much like we today can't imagine our life without our smartphone, folks in the 1890s couldn't do without the trains. The passenger train business was a competitive business. In 1872, the first outside railroad connected into Texas, which opened up Texas to the rest of the nationwide rail network, and this was the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad, which was known as the MKT. In 1880, the railroad was leased to the Missouri Pacific Railroad, which was known as MOPAC. The name of the MKT was changed to the Kansas-Texas Division, or the KT, which gave rise to the nickname Katy. So, Austin listeners, your favorite freeway was named for the Missouri Pacific Railroad tracks, the MOPAC. And Houston listeners, the town of Katy was a stop on the Kansas-Texas Division tracks. So there you go. Railroads were competing for passengers, And like any competitive business, the railroads were always looking for ways to increase their ridership. The KD was no different, and the person in charge of passenger ticket sales was called the passenger agent. The KD had hired a man from Louisville, Kentucky, named William George Crush. Crush had worked for the KD for about three years when he was promoted to the general passenger agent with orders to increase sales. Crush came up with an idea for a publicity stunt that had never been done before and hasn't been done since. Much like today's rubberneckers that slow our roads down, gawking at even the most minor traffic accident, and much like the people who only watch car racing for the wrecks, back in 1896, people would flock to the scene of a train wreck. Now, it must have been something to see these gargantuan trains come off the tracks and see such great machines and 
various stages of damage. And Crush knew that people loved to see this, so he decided he would give the people what they want, each stage a train wreck. It was both a brilliant and insanely dangerous idea, but management approved. So Crush set the date as September 15, 1896. The first issue he had was where to stage it. So Crush picked out a spot a few miles south of West Texas, which is a town north of Waco between Waco and Hillsboro. There was a spot near the main line where two hills came down into a shallow valley. Crush went to work building what would soon become the second largest city in the state of Texas, only for a few hours, but nevertheless it was the second largest city in the state. He built four miles of temporary track for two trains to travel toward each other. A separate two-mile spur was built so all the spectator trains could deliver the eager throngs to this big event. Crush then needed some trains to wreck, so he found two old steam engines. One was old 999. Now, I don't know, you know, in every train song and article about trains you read, the uh, steam engines are always called old this and old that, so we're going to keep that tradition. Old 999. He painted old 999 green with red trim. Then he found old 1001, which he painted bright red with green trim. And those would be the gladiators for this battle. He found enough old freight cars to make them seem like short trains. I think he had six cars on each side. And he put old 999 and old 1001 on a publicity tour of Texas and Oklahoma. Then he went to work on the festival site. He began constructing all the facilities at the crash site, and he named the place Crush, Texas after himself. He got a circus tent from the Ringling Brothers Circus to serve as an on-site restaurant. He drilled two water wells to supply all the people with plenty of water. He built a small depot for the new town of Crush with a 2,100-foot platform. That's almost half a mile. He also set up a carnival midway for all the patrons. He charged the concession sellers to be there, of course, raising even more money. And one newspaper account described the Midway as having, quote, exhibitions of freaks and other attractions familiar as sideshow entertainments, close quote. So I don't think you'd read that today, but that's what they wrote back in 1896. Of course, there were several grandstands built, and he even built a small jail in case anyone got a little too excited about what he was now calling the crash at Crush. Crush had a bandstand built. He had entertainment planned. He also had two telegraph offices. He had to build three different speaker stands for politicians. He had invited the politicians to speak, and I can assure you as an elected official, we would never pass up such an opportunity to address what was sure to be several thousand voters. The whole thing was free. That's right. There was no ticket needed for the crash at Crush. Instead, the KD offered a special fare from 2 to $5 anywhere in Texas round trip to attend the event, so people were coming from all over the state. As I mentioned earlier, Crush had been taking the two trains he was going to wreck around the state, promoting his crash at Crush, and it became apparent to him that this was going to become a very popular event. Crush told one newspaper that he expected about 20,000 people to attend on his $2 round trip fare, and this was really going to be awesome for the railroad. Well, the fateful day came, September 15, 1896, and the trains to Crush began arriving at dawn. There would eventually be 33 fully loaded passenger trains bringing patrons to the big event. The trains were so loaded that many of the passengers were riding on top of the cars. By the afternoon, Crush, Texas had a population of about 40,000 people, which made it the second largest city in Texas on that particular day. Politicians made speeches, the kids rode the carnival rides and played the games, People, uh, I assume, looked at all the what the newspaper described as the freaks. They ate in the restaurants. They had picnics on the grounds. The anticipation for the great crash was very high. No reports on whether they used the jail or not, however, but it was there. Now, here's a little interesting tidbit. Crush had gone, William Crush, the boss, had gone to the Katie's mechanical experts and asked about the safety issues of the wreck that he planned to stage. Crush had been assured that this wreck could come off safely, but apparently there was one old-timer in the shop that said that one or both of these trains might explode, and Mr. Crush decided to ignore that particular piece of advice. So at 5 p.m. on September 15th, it was time. 
Old 999 and old 1001 inched forward on their track and touched like they were shaking hands before a boxing match. Each engine had six cars attached, and those cars were covered in advertisements. Engineer C.E. Stanton drove old 999, and Engineer Charles Kane was aboard old 1001. The men backed their trains to the end of their tracks on their respective sides, and they awaited the signal to start. William Crush had strung cables several hundred feet from the track to keep the throngs contained, and he called this the deadline. He allowed one photographer up on a stand to get a picture of the action a little bit closer to the wreck. Thomas Edison had sent one of his cameramen from New York to try to film the action, and Crush rode out on a white horse in front of the crowd up to the middle of the track. He raised his hat, and as the engineers built up the steam pressure in their respective trains, Crush whipped his hat down and the engineers jammed open the throttles all the way. After about 500 yards, Charles Kane jumped from his train just as they planned, but old C.E. Stanton rode old 999 a little farther, which worked the crowd up into a frenzy, but he too bailed out as they had planned. One newspaper reported that some of the crowd pressed past the cable as the trains were screaming down the tracks toward each other. The trains closed at about 45 miles per hour each, and they came together in a tremendous crash of iron and steel and wood. There was only one not-so-small problem. The trains telescoped when they hit, which means that the cars behind ran through the cars in front. And the bigger problem was that the boiler of old 999 exploded like a bomb, despite Crush's feeling that it wouldn't. The explosion sent metal and debris rocketing through the crowd. Unfortunately, three people were killed and dozens were injured. The newspapers of the time reported that photographer J.C. Dean took a bolt through his eye, which obviously is not very good for a photographer. The Denison newspaper, the Sunday Gazetteer in Denison, Texas, described Mr. Dean as a, quote, martyr to his enterprise, close quote, because apparently he got some pretty good pictures before he was blinded. The newspapers were fairly frank about all the injuries. One farmer was knocked from a tree. A Waco fireman took a flying piece of iron right in his chest. There were skulls crushed and skulls fractured. One detail that you probably won't read in the uh, history books is that the first death actually occurred before the collision even occurred. And that was unfortunately one of the spectator trains pulling out of Abbott, Texas, north of west. Abbott, by the way, is the home of Willie Nelson. Uh, An unfortunate passenger was trying to get to the rear car on the train and ended up falling down between the cars which uh, of a moving train, which of course resulted in his death, but it was not reported that the train was in any way delayed because of that problem. Neither the shock of the huge collision or the explosion nor the inevitable cries of the wounded kept the throng of 40,000 people from climbing all over the wreck shortly after the smoke cleared. People were busy collecting souvenirs from the destroyed locomotives. One part of a smokestack was said to have traveled over a quarter of a mile as a result of the crash. One little boy had a part of a bell land right at his feet. Luckily, didn't hit him. Uh, truthfully, it's a wonder that more people weren't killed or injured. But I'm sure it was a heck of a show. By nightfall, the spectator trains had cleared out the town of Crush, Texas, And due to the injuries and deaths, the Katy Railroad fired Mr. Crush right there and then on the spot. But there wasn't a whole lot of negative fallout from the problem. So the next morning, September 16th, Mr. Crush was rehired by the Katy. Uh, The railroad willingly compensated the families of the dead and injured, and apparently all was okay. Um, Let me read to you the lead from the Sunday, September 20th, 1896 edition of the Denison Sunday Gazetteer. Quote, The event at Crush Tuesday was a grand success so far as the collision and the getting together of a big crowd of people were concerned, but the killing of two or three spectators and the serious wounding of several others changed a scene of intense excitement and pleasure into one of sadness. There will never be another prearranged collision of railroad mo- locomotives for public entertainment in Texas. The one at Crush was the first and the last. The people realize that such experiments are too dangerous, close quote. Well, I'm sure to Mr. Crush it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now, an interesting side story to this tale is that the famous ragtime composer Scott Joplin 
wrote a piece of music in honor of this big event. One of his earliest works was called The Great Crush Collision March, and it was dedicated to the MK&T Railroad. And that music was copyrighted just 30 days after the collision, so it's very possible that Joplin was actually there at the event. William George Crush went on to work for the Katy Railroad until 1940. He died in Dallas. He's buried in Cavalry Hill Cemetery. And here's something interesting about Mr. Crush. A few years after the collision, he traveled to Dallas with another businessman and the rector of the Dallas Catholic Cathedral. They joined the Knights of Columbus, and they came back to Texas and were reportedly the first Knights of Columbus in the state of Texas. And when a new degree of that organization was established, William George Crush was the first master, so he was definitely a man of prominence in, the, in uh, Dallas Catholic circles. And he sure had an eye for a show. Well, now we come to the part of the Wise About Texas we call Getting There, where I tell you how to go see a couple of places mentioned in the episode. Crush, Texas was located just east of where Wiggins Road crosses I-35, just south of the town of West, Texas. The exact location is on private property now, and the historical marker has been moved to the train depot in West. But if you look on a map, uh, Wiggins Road, as it goes east of I-35, crosses some railroad tracks, and that's where it was. William George Crush was buried in the Calvary Hill Cemetery in Dallas, so you can visit his grave at 3225 Lombardi Lane. There's also a museum, a railroad museum, in Galveston, Texas, that's got some great rolling stock, and you can even ride a train down there in the harbor area of Galveston. It's great for the kids. You can look at their website at galvestonrrmuseum.com and check it out when you're down there and see just how big and magnificent these trains were. There's a Museum of the American Railroad currently under construction in Frisco, Texas. They also have a website, uh, www.museumoftheamericanrailroad.org, where you can keep track of the progress on their permanent location. And they do have some temporary exhibits set up in the town of Frisco, so you can check that out. And that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you to the over 8,000 listeners of this show. Many of you are so generous as to want to support the show financially. So go to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas, and you can check that out. And don't forget to like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page and follow the show on Twitter at Wise About Texas. Well, I certainly appreciate you listening to this episode of Wise About Texas. Until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.